Well, first of all, I'm Ernie Manus, and I'm thrilled to be here and given the opportunity to reminisce with Sal Solo of Classics Nouveau. New music out for the first time in about 37 years or so as a band. The song that they have put back out is Inside Outside, which, if I'm correct, you originally recorded 40 years ago. Is that right? <laughs> well, that's what the fans tell us, you know. There's, uh, I was thinking earlier, one of my favorite books from when I was a child, A Christmas Carol by Dickens, and it begins, it must be understood that Marley was quite dead. Okay, <laughs> that's the beginning of the, the whole story doesn't make sense without that. And so it must be understood that Classics Nouveau was quite dead. And uh, come, come about 85, we thought that was it. It's come and it's gone. Nobody will ever think about it again. Even the Stones were not really active very much in the 80s. And so the idea of bands reforming and continuing and going on forever, it just didn't happen. Uh, in New York, the first time we came over to the States, our agent said he had tickets for the Stones and he wanted to see if they could still rock at 40. <laughs> so the, the, the idea of bands, you know, uh, playing into their 70s uh, was, was quite unknown. The other day I was watching um, the movie, uh, Bohemian Rhapsody, and I thought to myself, if you could go back in time to 1975 and tell them 50 years in the future, people will love your music even more and there'll be stage shows and movies, they could not have imagined such a thing. Well, and so I was going to say, I have really changed. I have known you for years. This is an interview I thought, I was sure we would never do talking about new classics material because for all the time I've known you, and I'll get into that in a second, it's always been, that was a chapter of your life. It was closed. You have good memories, maybe a few awkward memories of it, but for the most part, it was a moment, but you had moved on. And I had asked you many times, come on, are you guys gonna get back? To no, no, no. You have proven me wrong, but I think you proved yourself wrong too, huh? Well, and I'll, I'll let you into a little secret. We all get old. And uh, <laughs> I've, I've done weird things lately, like even contacting some old school friends. I didn't ever want to know about school all my life. And then all of a sudden, I'm thinking after all these years, I wonder what they did with their lives. And it's been kind of fun catching up, you know? Yeah, I will tell you to, to, place, to place myself in this story so that the listeners and viewers understand. So years ago, I was doing a radio series in Chicago, a radio show, and we got to a point where I wanted to do a show called Ernie's Obsessions. And we were gonna find some of my favorite musical artists who we didn't hear from much anymore on our side of the pond. And one of them was Bonnie Tyler, and the other was Classics Nouveau. And my friend's like, well, why are you looking for Classics Nouveau? As far as we knew over here, they had one kind of hit. And I'm like, no, but I, I love Sal Solo. I want to find him. We searched. We got a hold of the Musicians Union in the UK. And they were like, yeah, we can't give you any information about him. But we can stick a note in his file. And if he comes by and he sees that, you know, it's up to him if he wants to contact you. But you're, I'll pass the story you're missing over to out. You. You're missing out a very important piece of your story because you haven't told the audience how you came to discover Classics Nouveau. Well, it was a couple of things. First of all, MTV, because it was new and it had your video playing all the time when it first came out with Guilty. And my mom was a huge fan. And she was like, you've got to listen to this group. You'll love them. And then she actually got me my first classics album. And she fell in love with the song Nasty Little Green Men. And that was her big song from you guys. She loved I did that. Not know, I did not know that. But, you didn't uh, know that? <laughs> no, I didn't know that. But uh, I'm glad that mom got a mention anyway. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, so I'm still living in London at the time. And I got a call from the Musicians Union. And uh, they said, this guy in Chicago wants to talk to you, but we wouldn't give him your number. Do you want to talk with him? And I was a little bit guarded because I don't know why, but I'm the kind of artist that tends to attract very weird fans and stalkers you know there's people that show up in any country i ever appear in and even to this day there's one woman in paris she's been 35 years trying to get, engage me online she even found the church i worked for and wrote to the secretary hoping she would pass on the message she's, <laughs> i've never once spoken with her in 35 years and she's never given up so uh, so normally i'm a bit uh, kind of wary about people pursuing me 
but uh, this, this was one that had a happy ending because uh, when I eventually came to Chicago and met you and your mom, your mom kind of reminded me of my mom and uh, we uh, kind of formed a great relationship there. And uh, I've been fascinated with your obsession over the years because I know you've got some bits of memorabilia and patches and things that you go for that mm -hmm. nobody else would ever think of. Well, and I have something that nobody else has. And I don't know if I'm supposed to say it or not. Go ahead. But I am in possession of the ultimate Classics Nouveau memorabilia. Many years ago, Sal gifted to me his very first silver disc from Yugoslavia for night people. And I have it and it's framed and it is the disc you received. Yeah, uh, well, I guess the, you, you, the, the, the problem is everybody that's on the fan clubs and things now will be at one in a silver disc, so I cannot help them out. But uh, the, the next part of the story after, uh, you know, uh, Mali being definitely dead and Classics Nouveau dead is the way that the fan groups on Facebook have grown up over recent years. I absolutely, I, I don't know who started them. I don't know who runs them. Um, and initially, when they started sending me invitations, I didn't pay a whole lot of attention because I thought, I don't know who this, th these people are. I don't know why they're interested in this stuff. And over the years, it's just got more intense. And so now, pretty much every day, I see people posting stuff from countries we have not even been, like Estonia and Uruguay. And some of the messages are in Spanish and other languages. And uh, so the things they, they post, they post tickets from old shows. I was fascinated to see people could see us for one pound or five pounds and see you two the next day, you know, at the same venue. And so that's kind of interesting. And they post dates. And Do you find over the years you're gathering new fresh fans or is it more reminiscent fans who remember the days? It seems to be both because um, I see a lot of them posting. They wish they'd been at the Classics Nouveau concert back in the day. So obviously they must be later fans. Yeah. Um, and those who were at the concerts, obviously kind of bragging on that and <laughs> saying, saying what it was like. I was listening to, uh, excuse me, for I digress, but I was listening to a CD this morning of some Finnish heavy metal band that has cellos instead of guitars. And uh, the drums are just so great. And it took me back to BP back in the day. He used to have huge speakers as monitors. These days, they wear little linear uh, head headphones, you know, uh, earphones. Uh, back then, he had massive speakers either side of him. And so he was hammering away at, at full blast the whole time. And it was one of the things that made it so exciting, I guess, in the concerts. But um, the, the things that the fans keep posting all the time, like dates of releases, I have no idea where they get that information. <laughs> well, I, I want to talk about the past a bit more, but I don't want to bury our lead. I've got to know what led to the new single coming out. How in the world did this come together? Because I know you well enough to know this is an odd turn for you. It is, yes. Um, well, mo above everything else, it's the fan groups, really, because uh, uh, I, I guess I started to kind of feel guilty because it's like, wow. No pun intended. <laughs> I didn't even think of that. <laughs> but, uh, wow. Um, I, I, I started to think, wow, this, this stuff, what we did means a lot more to them than it's kind of meant to me over the years. And uh, so I, I, I kind of felt a bit like the Queen of England in the sense that well, when you're born into the royal family, you have duties, you have responsibilities. <laughs> you, you can't just live like a normal person, a normal life. And uh, some years back, I'd, uh, maybe 10 or 12 years ago, I had been dabbling in a period of inactivity. I'm the kind of person, if I don't have a lot to do, I don't just kind of get depressed and stay in bed or watch TV all day. I have to find something uh, you know, creative, something to invent, something to make. And one of the great things for me over the years has been the way the technology has, has gone. You know, Once I got to a point where I was saying, wow, we used to record at Abbey Road and the most famous studios of the world, and now I can get better sound on my little MacBook. <laughs> and so that to me is fasc fascinating and challenging and classics. I mean, I'm sure many uh, people here in America, they have no idea who Classics Nouveau was, so they don't even know what style it was. But in the early 80s, it was a time when a lot of stuff was new. 
a lot of equipment, a lot of sounds, a lot of electronics, drum machines just came in for the first time. And uh, so we've always been kind of attuned to something new. New sounds are always exciting for us uh, and, and me in particular. And so even when something would come along, like say the famous record by Cher with the auto tune, and we never had auto tune back in our day, we had to sing in tune. <laughs> I'm not sure we even had guitar tuners. I, I seem to think, think that uh, they were very, very expensive and only Eric Clapton had a guitar tuner back in the day. Um, so uh, I was kind of mentally logging those, those things. And so at a certain point, I, I guess just for idle uh, amusement, I thought, I wonder what Classics Nouveau would sound like today if we had all of that stuff available to us. So just for my private entertainment and enjoyment, I worked on a few old classic songs and I kept it very quiet, didn't tell a soul I was doing it and didn't play it to anybody. And that was it. You know, I kind of got busy again and forgot about it. And uh, so then when the fans recently started posting all these dates, you've got an anniversary coming up of your first album and so on. I reached out to the other guys who I hadn't spoken to for years and said, uh, what about us uh, trying to do a new uh, recording uh, just for the fans, to give the fans a surprise on one of these anniversaries? And they all liked Inside Outside, Best of the Lot, and that's what happened. So why do why re-record re or cover one of your own pieces? Why not something new? <laughs> well, the second part is, of your question is quite complex. I'll come to it. But the first part is that we were not really talking about reforming, getting the band together again or anything like that, because the four of us live in three different countries now. You know, we're separated by an ocean. So the idea of physically coming together is not really on the cards. Um, and I think it's almost like getting a do-over, really. You know, if you could go back 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, and all the things you didn't do quite right or you didn't know back then that you know now, it was, it was kind of tempting to say, hmm, maybe we could do it a bit better now than we, we could back then. Yeah. I'm, sure, I'm sure many of the fans think we didn't do it better because they're attached to the original and messing with the soundtrack of people's lives is very dangerous. But just for, our, for ourselves, uh, we wanted to do it what, the way that we thought was better than we could have done back then. It's almost, yeah. to, almost to make up because the first two Classics Nouveau albums were strange in that they didn't give us a producer. And I really don't know why, because we were stupid <laughs> kids. We were stupid kids in our 20s that didn't know anything but thought we knew everything. And they, they, they wasted their money leaving us on our own in the studio to do what we wanted. If I was them, I would have said, okay, like it or not, here's somebody that's a professional. They're going to make your stuff sound good. And uh, we never had that. And so really, I kind of felt we lacked a little bit in the uh, production area in those early days. The second half of my question was, why not something new? <laughs> oh, dear, you're not going to let me off that one. No, I'm not. Um, it seems to me almost impossible to go back. Now, in a way, we're not going back because we're trying to sort of sound like we would sound in 2021. Um, but we're not trying to compete with uh, the bands that have grown up since or the bands that are hot today because they should have their, their chance. They should have their day just as we did. And uh, our fans are typically going to be people in their 50s, really. They used to be in their 15s at the time, but they're in their 50s now. And um, so what is unique and special about our band is that we were there at the beginning of what came to be called the new romantic thing, the mm. new romantic style. And so the new romantic style, it was that kind of slightly robotic, electronic-y kind of sound. Um, the, the, the rhythms were sort of uh, very fixed and the, the, the lot of synth sounds and things like that. Um, but to get myself into the mindset of 40 years ago, how I used to write a song, what I wanted to say, um, I just can't really do that. I've tried, but yeah. it doesn't work too well. And we're still talking about it. You know, we're sort of talking about trying something else now that the fans were so excited that we did something. Um, but I just don't know if it can happen or not. Well, I'm not going to leave that train of thought, but I am going to jump over to the side a little bit. I'm a huge 80s kid. I have followed a lot of those groups up through, not as closely as I have Classics Nouveau, mind you, 
but the ones that I have listened to, their lead singers, the, the vocalists, time has shown on their voices. I have to tell you how impressed I was with how great your voice sounded almost, and I know that there's, there's processing on it and the, the, the little bit of the echo to it and such, but the voice itself almost feels smoother, richer, better today. What's your thought? Well, thank you for that, first of all. Um, I think, to be honest, we're all better now than we were in the band. Um, you know, BP has always been a, a powerhouse, as I said, but he's uh, very thoughtful these days in, in arrangements and even down to little details. Gary is a guitar teacher now. And so when he started sending me his guitar tracks, I was really impressed. Like he'd give me a whole range of things that I could use in the mix. And so from the heaviest things and uh, down to funky little stuff. And I'm not sure he could do all that back in the day, or maybe we didn't give him a chance to do it. I don't know. Um, but the, the fans, of course, of the early classics, they, they loved the growling and shrieking that I used to do. But at the same time, those who hated classics hated it for that reason as well. And uh, so if I'd have just kind of sung smoothly back then and dressed kind of normal, then maybe we would have been a lot more popular. But uh, by about 85, I think I was coming out of the angry young man <laughs> vibe and coming into more of a sort of, you know, let's get good at this. In fact, I went to singing teacher. I, I probably didn't ever tell you that. I went to singing teacher um, at some point. I think it must have been in the mid 80s. And... Uh, she had tried to uh, teach Johnny Rotten, I think, at one time. I, I don't think she succeeded. Um, but she loved Annie Lennox, was kind of her vocal hero. And he, even, to be honest, when I called her, first of all, because this is in the days when we had to call people. We didn't have the internet and everything. And so I called her to ask for singing lessons. And she said, I've seen you on TV. I don't think you uh, need to learn how to sing. And I said, well, I think I do. And uh, she taught me some classical and breathing stuff. And the other thing was, come about 85, I started getting into choirs, of course. So I had the, the hit with San Damiano, the boys' choir, first of all. I went on to do some songs with gospel choirs, and that kind of completely blew my mind because they were so good. And today, my job is uh, directing choir for a local church. And so now I know everything about harmonies and arrangements and writing music that I did not know back then. But now I have to kind of keep my voice behind everybody else's. And so it's a lot more controlled and mellow. Plus, of course, I've got old anyway. Yeah. No, uh, stop that. <laughs> <laughs> so tell me a little bit about the processing you put on the voice, because I'm assuming you mixed the album or the song, correct? Yes, they all uh, they all sent me their various parts and their suggestions and thoughts and comments. And make and sure we get it all right. Who are all who which iteration of the band are we talking? Oh, the golden era, of course, you know, night people, uh, is it a dream, uh, la verite, you know, so this is uh, B BP, I always say he's the founder of Classics Nouveau, because he persuaded me, he said, uh, he said, the first night I met him, he said, I want to form a van with you. And uh, so it was BP on drums, uh, Mick had been in a previous band with me called The News, and uh, Gary Stedman, he was not our very first guitarist, we had Jack from X-Ray Specs was with us about six weeks. And then as soon as he went, then uh, we auditioned a load of people and we chose Gary. And so he was with us um, through all of our peak times, really. Um, so they were all sending me their parts. Now with the voice, and uh, there was a couple of things I, I noticed that the fans write online. Um, one of them wrote, Sal doesn't sound like Sal. And uh, so I think what, it, what he meant was, Sal of 1981 doesn't sound like Sal of 2021, <laughs> which, is, which is a good thing from my point of view. You know, that's intentional. And um, part of it is who does sound? You know, Elton doesn't sound like Elton from his heyday either. You know, Frank Sinatra, the old Frank Sinatra didn't sound like the young Frank Sinatra. So we all change and we develop. So that's yeah. the first thing. But in my case, it was quite intentional. I mentioned to you, all the different um, inventions that have come out since we were recording and stuff like the big auto-tune thing that Cher used. I was kind of just fascinated with that. I thought that'd be fun to try, you know, because we didn't have that option before. And also the, um, the, the whole question of 
what would a classics nouveau sound like? I mean, for that matter, what would any 80s band sound like in the 2020s? And how do we um, kind of make it up to date and modern, which is what the fans tell us we succeeded at, but at the same time kind of be recognizable as a star from the 80s. And so I, just trying to get that blend between the electronics and more of a guitar rock band and the good sounds that we have today, all of that was what led me to do it that way. And we, the other songs that we've messed with, they don't all sound like that, but uh, I, I kind of enjoy the, uh, the, the more electronically, slightly robotic sound. And another part of the story that not everybody knows, I think you know, but uh, is that I was also with a band in Italy for a while, for, well, actually over several albums, uh, that they were enormous. They were like a household name in Italy. They were called Rockets. They sold a million and a half albums. And they, they still have an incarnation today with just one original member and they go and do massive shows in Moscow and places. <laughs> but uh, their main voice that made them famous was a vocoder. So it's kind of like Daft Punk. So mm -hmm. the electronic-y kind of voice is something that's kind of in there. There's a connection for me with all of my history. And so I'm always tempted to go there a little bit. So what will it take to get you to release the other tracks that you guys have been playing around with? Well, <laughs> first of all, it would be finishing them. And <laughs> so that's, that, that's not as easy as you might think, because um, as I said, not only living in other countries, but also um, Mick is kind of almost off the grid somewhere in rural Ireland. And so we sometimes we'll hear from him on a day and then we don't hear from him again for ages. Uh, Gary is, as I mentioned, is a teacher now, and so he has limited time. Uh, BP is a man of leisure, so he can <laughs> do what he wants. When, although, although I think he loves fishing just about as much as he loves music, so uh, he's sometimes out on a boat. But uh, so, and, and plus, I, I've got a regular job. You know, I actually have a, for one of the first times in my life, I have a day job working <laughs> a choir. So. Uh, it has to kind of develop in its own time. That, that's the first thing. But also we do have to weigh the fans' sensibilities. You know, we don't want to upset anybody by um, disrespecting, <laughs> disrespecting the music that they, they love so much, you know. And at the, but at the same time, we wouldn't want to do a kind of cover version of our own song. We'd have to make it something new. Right. So part of the debate that's going on right now is should we just... Should we drastically change the old ones or should we just take the drastic changes we want to make and try and make something new out of that? Yeah. So, well, I will, I will give you this one bit of advice from many authors I have spoken to over the years who have had their books turned into movies. I asked them, you know, is it hard to see that transformation? And what they always say to me is the movie can be out there, the book still exists. So the changes can be made, but you can still have the original. And I, that's how I feel about Classics Nouveau. You have the freedom and the right to work on the material that you created. We still have the original recordings and we have new understandings of them and new interpretations of them through your guys' eyes this many years later. Well, thank you for that advice. I, I think it's good advice. Although I really do feel that the fans own this. Uh, a lot of people ask, why, why would you come back after all these years? There's only for one reason, and that's because of the fans. They, they didn't want to let go. We let go of Classics Nouveau decades ago, but they did not, and they won't let go of it. Well, and, speaking of the original, you oh, guys yes. have yet another release out, <laughs> which is all of the Liberty recordings from 1981 to 1983, which is the three, be it four, major albums you did. Do you go back and listen to it? Do you, when you listen to it, do you revisit them as you were then, or is it looking at them through today's eyes? How do you hear them? I, I don't listen to them. I, I, the, really? the, the, record, the record company was kind enough to send me a few copies of that CD set. Um, so it's on my shelf, but I haven't opened it. And um, I, I don't really think I could stand to go back. Um, it's, it's a weird thing because I, I like the memories in my head but if, if I'm listening to something, it's, it's not only our music, actually, because back in the day, when I was friends with all the bands that were making it and on the same uh, record labels as all the big stars of the day, I would constantly be invited to their concerts. Of course, I, I'd show up in the door and they'd just open the door for <laughs> us and let us walk right through. Um, and 
it, it kind of spoiled me in a strange way because after that, I could never really go and just enjoy a concert as a fan because I'd always be looking at who's playing or how they did that, what the equipment was, you know, uh, I, I would have done it different or they did that great. And so in a strange way, it takes away some of the enjoyment and the naivety. Um, if I go back to when I was a teenager and I, I, I was just a fan and I would go to a concert and it, it was so exciting, wasn't it? You know where you see the lights on the amplifiers and you're waiting for them to come on and all this stuff. I, I've kind of lost my innocence. <laughs> and then, uh, some of these live things that they started releasing, the river sessions and, and so on, I think they, they sent me some of that for approval. And so I had to listen through to one of those the first time. And I was quite surprised to find it wasn't as bad as I expected. Uh, so actually, you know, because when you're young, you're fearless, really. You know, I, I, I can't explain any other way. When you're a teenager, when you're in your 20s, you just think you can conquer the world and that's that. And then as, as you get older, you start somehow analyzing things or going over past experiences or whatever. And you think, no, I can't do that unless I prepared this and, and all that kind of stuff. And so you, you would never start and do anything if you wait until you were 40, I think. Well, then tell me this, when you were doing Inside Outside, did you go back and listen to the original recordings or did you just work off the music and knowing it moving forward? Did you listen, compare, uh, critique to create change? How, how did you go about it? I don't think we, I don't think we really did listen to the original. I, th I think Really? I think we kind of did it from memory, you know, we could, uh, we could, what we would remember of the song is what went in there. And uh, that, that was about it, really. Um, and the same would go for any classic Nouveau songs if we redo them. Um, we're not really looking to recreate anything from the original. The question would just be today in 2020, how would we do this? Yeah bearing in mind the people we are today and the musicians we are today. I mean, another aspect that's fascinating me with the fans is these days they're talking about the lyrics and they say a lot of the lyrics of the classic songs seem to still apply today. And uh, in Inside Outside, you know, we were talking about a kind of crazy, depressing world around us and it's still a crazy, depressing world, unfortunately, <laughs> today. Uh, talking about that and the new, the new catalog release, is that there are remixes and new versions. Any chance of a longer version of Inside Outside? Is it done for now? Remixes, what, what are your thoughts on it? I, I think that that's another mindset we have to get into. Um, because back in the day, you see 12 inch singles, as we used to call them. I, I saw again, some of the fans asking why certain songs had 12 inch singles and certain songs didn't. That whole thing kind of came into its own somewhere in the early 80s because of the, the, the kind of dance clubs that were mm. growing up, Pro probably in New York, the big gay clubs and things like that. Uh, they, they were looking for these extended mixes. And so all of a sudden it got to a point where if you had a good dance track, then um, don't just release the radio song, but try and do something more. And uh, so we would even, again, I'm kind of learning this from what the fans read, but the, uh, the fans say that we would even go back and revisit some of our earlier songs and do an extended mix. And uh, so I, I kind of have to get back into that mindset. I've thought, I've thought about it. So I guess the answer would be, yeah, there is a chance. Yeah. What about fans mixing some and sending them in? Would you like to hear what they're doing with it? Oh, absolutely. I didn't even know that was a thing. And so I'd <laughs> love to hear it. On our official uh, Classics Nouveau YouTube page, um, there's a couple of playlists and one of them is all cover versions and there's about 40 cover versions there. Some of them are, are like drum covers or bass covers. There are a few vocal ones. There's even one that's a mashup of some, with some rapper. It's like Guilty mixed with, I, I, I'm guessing he's an English rapper, this guy. Never heard of him, but yeah. it, it's, it's just completely fascinating. Who would have thought of that? We, we wouldn't. Yeah. Tell me, what would Guilty sound like today? Uh, Guilty's a tricky one. I, I tried it, but, um, and I, I was kind of discussing this with Gary lately. I said, I, I don't know how we can make that sound like uh, 2021, because it seems to me what really made it unique was the growl 
and I don't do the growling anymore. <laughs> oh, come on, you can growl a little for us, can't you? Uh, I just don't feel that way. I, I, I tried, <laughs> you know, I, we tried a little bit of work on, is it a dream? And one of my friends told me, if you don't go satisfaction, you know, it's not going to be, is it a dream? <laughs> and so for, if you, you know, me from this demure kind of choir singer I am today, to, get, to go back there is tough. Do, does your choir know the Sal before them? Do they know who you are? Uh, I kind of hope they don't, but uh, <laughs> I, su I suspect they do, uh, yeah. spe especially the young musicians. You know, occasionally when I see on Facebook or something, somebody from church putting a like against some classic Snowboard thing, I think, uh-oh, I wonder what they're thinking about this. <laughs> because what, one yeah. of the things, uh, excuse me for a second, but one of the things, I, again, I find weird with the fans is over the years, some of them seem to think that I hated classics nouveau because I became a Christian. And so they think of a Christian like a, a, a Puritan or maybe like an Amish or something like, you know, we do have electricity and we do have cars <laughs> and we do have music. And actually we probably have more music than you because we sing in church every Sunday. <laughs> and uh, so I, I, I never hated what I did before because I was a Christian or disapproved of it or anything like that. It, I think it was simply the need to move on. And yeah. so when you're known for a particular thing, uh, you know, when George Michael started doing his own thing, he had to kind of forget wham, you know? And uh, so this, this and, and in my case, the, the transformation, of course, was, was much more drastic. And so I needed to establish my identity on my own, aside from classics. And that's why I think I distanced myself for a long time. There, there are two stories out there of the end of Classics Nouveau. One is that your your growth into your spirituality and all of that, and your finding religion, quote unquote. And the other is that EMI, the price for the last album, they decided to say, okay, we're done. What what is the true story of the end of the band? It was it was the latter. It was it was quite simple that uh, the budget for the third album went way over what they expected, and so they dumped us at that moment. And so that was it. <laughs> we, yeah. had, we had no choice, really. We were done. And uh, back then, as I said, bands didn't usually continue or regroup. I mean, for a couple of years, we had some thoughts about trying to farm around for a new deal. Uh, but then in the meantime, uh, I had a hit with San Damiano on my own. So and who released Heart and Soul then? Well, that was a different record company because, you see, when I did, when I did San Damiano, um, it wasn't that I had anything against classics. I was still doing tours with classics at the time, but it was a sound and a message which represented me specifically and not the band. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, even one of the band, I remember when we were in a, in a tour bus in Poland and I, I'm reading and he comes by and he says, oh, what are you reading? And it was probably the Bible or something. And he said, oh, that's, that's great. I hope I get that one day. <laughs> and uh, I, I was never going to ram it down people's throats and try and force all the band to become what I had become, a Christian. And so I, I separated what I was doing that represented me from what I was doing with classics. And uh, so when Sendamiano became a hit, all of a sudden, of course, there was a demand for an album by me representing my new message and sound or whatever. And so I had a deal and classics didn't. And so that's really how it happened. It was not a choice. I, if I'd have had my way, I probably would have continued with classics forever, really. Yeah. Um, but that wasn't to be. Well, you're kind of getting another chance now. And this all is, of us are waiting over. <laughs> <laughs> If you were to write a new classic song today, just hypothetically, and you probably have played with this knowing you, but I'm curious, what do you think would be the message? What would classics be trying to point out today? What would they be looking at, thinking about as a band? What would your voice be saying in this world? I, I, I think that um, we probably would have to be more optimistic because even though the world is still a depressing place now as it was 40 years ago, and maybe more so in many ways, um, there's no point in fixating on the negative. I was just having a couple of emails back and forth with my brother today where he, he's very focused on all the terrible things and get ready for this and they're going to do this and so on. And I said, look, in our latter years, I don't want to fill my mind with negativity. 
what, what good what good is there obsessing with things that you cannot change so let's be thankful for all the good things that we've had in our lives and uh, the whole classics nouveau experience is among them you know now it's all gone we feel privileged to have been there and done that and uh, at the time I, I really didn't appreciate it at all i mean we toured in over 30 countries back in the day and i know the other guys as soon as we'd arrive in a, a city bangkok or uh, in tokyo or something they'd rush out with their cameras and uh, try and uh, get all the memorabilia but i never even had a camera in my life and uh, so i just didn't really appreciate it and now that I've lived a, more of a normal life for quite a few years, I realize that other people view what I experienced as extraordinary and something to aspire to. So I kind of think, oh, well, thank you, God, for that then, because I guess I was blessed. Well, I also think, too, the man you are today would not be there if it weren't for the experiences you had when you were younger and the world touring, the opening of your eyes as a, a young lad getting to experience these things that most people would never get to see. Well, I, I like the phrase that you use there of the man I am today, because um, a couple of people uh, who were involved with the band over the years had told me back in the day, I wasn't a very nice person. And uh, so I say, I'm, I'm sure you're right. And uh, Gary had said to me recently in email, I know you're not the man today that you were. Oh, I, th I think he put it a bit nicer than that. You're a different person today, is what he said. Yeah. You're a different person today. And so I took that as a compliment because I, I hope we can all continue improving as long as we're living and breathing, you know? So it's been a, it's been a long job of work with me to try and become a better person, really. <laughs> well, I, I find that hard to believe. As long as I have known you, you have always been a wonderful friend and a great guy and really have always, when we talked, given me a new way to look at the world and to look at my own situation and the same that you did with the music and that the message, which I think we've talked about in the past, the lyrics and the messages, even in the classics nouveau things were very optimistic and very being aware of your surroundings and seeing where you can go from there. And so I, I find it hard to believe that you were that different a guy before, but fame well, and success and a bunch of screaming fans can probably have their effect. Well, well, thank you for that. Um, one, one of the things, you know, I mentioned to you that I've, uh, I've tended to attract these very weird, obsessive fans and stalkers over the years and even to the present day. And so it sometimes would give me a, a kind of standoffish, um, a bit, I, 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 not, not necessarily in my thought pattern, but it would make me very suspicious of allowing uh, people. So even to this day, I don't usually post anything online. You'll see on the classics pages, you'll see BP engaging with the fans, sometimes Mick, but I never ever get into a public conversation because I'm afraid of who's gonna, you know, pick up, pick up on it. And uh, I've even had situations uh, lately where somebody who happens to have been accepted as one of my Facebook friends will send me a private message and next thing it's posted online for everybody. And uh, so I say, look, my privacy is very, very important. I like to live a normal life. One of the reasons I moved to America over 21 years ago was because here nobody really knows me. And so back in England, I felt people were always judging me on something from the past. They always thought they knew me from something. They knew me from yeah. Classics Nouveau. They knew me from San Damiano. So either I'm this terrible kind of Dracula character or I'm this crazy born again Christian. And uh, so here I'm, I can just be a regular. I'm just a choir director that works for a church, you know. <laughs> <laughs> now, I always wanted to think the reason you moved to the U.S. was you got to know me and you were like, hey, those Chicago people are cool. I'll move to the U.S. That's well, my you, theory. Well, well, you do make a good point there because I, I was 15 years in Chicago so I guess I did kind of get hooked and I do remember <laughs> one of the first times meeting you and mom and having a nice lunch outdoors somewhere um, close to your studios um, but uh, I do think that moving to America for me was just kind of like making more of my life like a, I guess maybe it was a midlife crisis or something I don't know <laughs> but uh, it, it was like I had to relearn everything because every, we think we're very similar because we we both speak a language which is called English but uh, I discovered we don't know anything uh, you know I didn't know what a post office sold here or what a Walmart I, what, I didn't know what a target was 
and just just so many things and so it was kind of fun being a baby again and so instead of saying i'm you know whatever age i am i can say now well i, I, I i'm 22 because that's the age, that's my rebirth in america <laughs> well sal before i let you go i don't want to take up too much of your time we've kind of addressed it a little bit but where does classics nouveau go from here uh i i just don't know um in the same way like two years ago I would have been as shocked as you to know that there'd ever be a new release from Classics Nouveau and especially uh, our golden lineup. But um, we're, we're willing to kind of keep entertaining the possibility of doing something. I'm, I feel pretty confident it will never be uh, touring again because of the, the distance and the cost that would be involved with trying to do that. Um, but we're certainly interested in experimenting with sound and songs and if, like you, like you mentioned, remixes, if people want to send us remixes or people have written songs or something that uh, could be classics, we'll certainly give them a listen and, and consider them. But I think people need to understand that what we all did 40 years ago is not what we're going to do today. Even when they're asking about clothes I wore like 40 years ago, I don't know anything about what happened with my clothes of 40. Do you? You know, no, what happened to your clothes from 40 years ago? <laughs> I still we, wear the same clothes. I'm uh, sorry. I'm kind of. <laughs> I, so, I know you got rid of a whole lot of your Classics Nouveau memorabilia, the things you had, because at the time you had moved on. Do you well, wish you well, held on to any of it? Uh, well, yes, actually. Um, when I, well, the thing was when I left England, you see, that was in 99. And so I had in my closet, I probably still had some of the old classics costumes and things. I had my old mirror guitar hanging on the wall. And I, I probably had tapes, like videotapes, you know, from concerts and things. And uh, I really ne didn't think that anybody would ever care about that stuff again in the future. So I just probably burnt it or something, or tra trashed it all, you know? And uh, I, to this day, I still don't know how the fans come up with live concert footage and so on, because we didn't have cell phones back then. So, and I don't think they walked into concerts carrying big movie cameras on their shoulders or anything. So I absolutely don't know how this stuff surfaces, but uh, it's, it's interesting that it does. Well, Sal, I can't thank you enough for chatting with not just me, but for all the fans right now to hear how things are going and to understand how Inside Outside came to be Folks can listen to it if they haven't heard it. It's on YouTube now. It's the 2021 version of it. And you can even go back and listen to the 1981 one if you really want to explore that too. Sal, thank you so much. Thanks, Aaron. Can, can, congratulations on your 25 years at PBS in Houston. Can you I believe mean, it? That, that means we must have known each other at least 30 years at this point. And <laughs> so uh, I, I, I'm, I'm glad we're still kicking and screaming. I am too. Sal, thank you so much. And thanks to everyone for listening and joining us on this little chat. Hopefully we can do this again. And if new music comes out, come back and let's talk about it. Okay. Okay.